Hi, it's J.B. Shoko, I'm host of Web Comics Reviews and Interviews. Tonight, we're dancing with Comics Kate. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. Let's start off with two stories. The first off, real basic st- fable. Specifically, a traveler who has a really great cloak traveling down a road. All of a sudden, the north wind and the sun see him, and they decide, hey, Let's take a bet. Whoever gets the guy's coat, cloak off him first wins. North Wind goes, okay, fine. I get to go first, right? Sun's like, sure, go for it. Well, what ends up happening is that the North Wind blows. He blows hard. He blows cold. The guy, of course, wraps himself tighter in his cloak. North Wind goes harder. He goes colder. The guy wraps himself even tighter in his cloak. North Wind goes as hard and as cold as he possibly can, figuring that this will force hitting him over the head with all this wind, all this cold, all this energy is going to cause him to drop the cloak. But as predictable, it actually causes the guy to wrap himself tighter and tighter in the cloak in order to stay warm. Suffice to say, the North Wind gives up. What happens then is that the sun just simply says, Fine, I'm just going to be nice and warm and friendly to this guy. And that's it. North Wind goes, Are you freaking serious? Well, also predictably, the heat causes the guy to sweat profusely. He decides, hey, I'm getting a little too warm, and he takes the cloak off. So if I say, history does not record what the sun won. But, the key here is that you, if you're going to convince somebody of whatever you're trying to convince them of, it's a lot better to take a warm, friendly approach rather than a cold and hard one. That's story one. Story two. Uh, and this is actual real life. Specifically, a couple of weeks ago with MCU's Captain Marvel Eminent release, a lot of people decided to go on to Rotten Tomatoes and load up on the negative pre-reviews. A pre-review, for those who don't know, allows you to say if you want to watch the movie, you're going to pass on the movie, and to explain why in either case. Well, a lot of people decided to load up on the negative reviews, which caused the score for Captain Marvel to go from a really great fresh score to a really horrible rotten score. Suffice to say, Rotten Tomatoes caught on, figured out that a lot of the messages were, shall we say, political, and decided to temporarily delete that feature. For those who don't follow, that means it's been removed until they figure out a way to place safeguards onto it to prevent it from happening again. Don't worry, as we go on throughout the podcast, I'll explain what these two stories have to do. The first, the second one, obviously, is that we have an organization, a very loose definition of organization, called Comicsgate. And they've decided they're going to become a gatekeeper organization to the comic book industry. Yeah, this isn't going to work out too well for them. So, obligatory just because I'm a nice guy. I'm going to give you a heads up warning. There's going to be a lot of race. There's going to be a lot of sex. And there's going to be a lot of politics. We're going to get up to our armpits in politics. If these are topics you do not want to hear about. And you're really tired of hearing. And trust me, I can fully sympathize with you on that. Um, just run. I'm not going to look down at you, obviously, I can't, but I definitely can respect your opinion on this. So, if you don't want to hear me talk about race, sex, and politics, just go do something else. Life is short. If you don't want to listen to me, I can't prevent you, obviously, but I can encourage you to have fun with whatever it is you're going to have fun with. For everybody else, here's where things get fun. 
The reason I'm calling this podcast Dancing with Comics Gate is because I'm sort of in a weird position. That is, there's a lot of things that Comics Gate says and is doing that I sort of agree with. I know that sounds like a weird concept, but trust me, if you're not used to weird concepts on this podcast, by now, something's just something seriously wrong. But the basic gist of the situation is that Comiskate is just basically doing everything it possibly can wrong. It's just they've got some really great intentions, but yeah, we all know where those tend to lead. They tend to lead to a really horrible place. And, well, like I said, you can't, the comics industry is just not one that tends to do great with gatekeeping. Occasionally it does, and it acquiesces, and when it does acquiesce, bad things happen. Just look at the Commerce Code Authority. It took us till like, what, 1980s to get rid of it? So, there's that. The real brief version is that Commerce Gate has a couple of different things that are, well, first off, they're a backlash organization. They're part of the conservative wave that's currently going through and hitting a lot of different media. Or media, sorry. And as part of this conservative wave, well, we're, it feels like it's got basically the last gasp. You know, that last hurrah right before it pretty much goes away for a little while. Or at least has a major reduction in power, which is sort of what I'm hoping here for. But... They're basically a backlash organization against all of political correctness, which is sort of where I can sympathize to a certain degree. Uh, I've made my views on political correctness pretty well known. But, yeah, don't worry if you haven't got onto it, you will by the end of this. However, because they are a backlash organization, they are basically tending to take things a little too strongly and do all the wrong things in order to make sure whatever they want to happen will happen without really looking at the consequences. You know, they've decided that certain things in comics should not exist, and because of this, well, they're going full bore with it. Boiling it down to a, the simplest and most common point, you know, because in an organization, you're going to have a lot of people all over the place. But boiling it down to as simple as possible points, they're against political messages in comics. They're anti-legacy characters, especially when those legacy characters are forced diversity. And they're against political correctness in general. In essence, they're trying to revert everything back to a simpler time. And without quite realizing that this simpler time they're trying to get everything back to never really existed. And, of course, the way they're doing this is threatening economic sanctions. You know, you keep what's up with this, I won't buy your book. And, of course, are waging a PR battle on all forms of social media. As well as other things like, um, well, YouTube, other podcasts, that sort of thing. The bottom line is, they're trying to basically spew conservative values, and it's just not quite working the way they want it to. You know, the Comics Gate is essentially the unholy spawn of the Gamers Gate controversy. Specifically, where everybody remembers when everything got really con um, controversial, pretty much everything, and you had a lot of people going that were pretty much taking up political posts and, you know, pretty much dying on them, so to speak. And, of course, you had the ultra-liberals against the ultra-conservatives, and everybody else pretty much stayed out of the way. So if I say, for the most part, that controversy is pretty much blown over, and we're seeing a lot of really cool things happening in video games. Unfortunately... That controversy decided to spread over into comics. And while you're seeing a lot of people spearheading it and really taking it in some really weird areas, at the same time, 
yeah, it's just, it's a really bad aim. So, what I'm going to be doing tonight is essentially boiling it down to taking those basic points I brought up and explaining to a certain degree why they're not necessarily bad, completely bad, but why we really need to think about this and at the same time come up with some interesting solutions to make the comic skaters happy. This is not because I'm trying to acquiesce and trust me, if like I said, there's a reason I'm calling this the Dancing With episode. It's going to get really weird, really strange, but, you know, straight up. If you're not used to weird and strange on this podcast, yeah, it's just, yeah. I hope you've gotten used to the weirdness and the strangeness of my podcast. So, let's have a little bit of fun, shall we? All right. First problem, let's deal with the dreaded political problem. Comicscape basically wants to eliminate political message from comics. Unfortunately, there is a number of problems with this, not the least of which is that comics have been political since pretty much day one. Now, I can understand where Comicscape is coming from in this because we've got so many people that... Well, remember the fable I started off with, the North Wind and the Sun? You've got a lot of the political people have gotten too much into being the North Wind. That is, they tend to like hitting you over the head with their politics and not really having any fun with the actual story. Because of this, you get some really interesting things that get introduced in terms of comics and it doesn't always work. Um, the best example is the recent Iron Iceman Limited series. You know, Iceman's gay. Okay, no problem. But he basically, did, you know, they made a big hullabaloo over introducing a drag queen mutant with, na- you know, with her name Shade, and her power is that she can teleport into her fan and out of it. You know? I'm just like, Seriously, you're going to call Drag Queen Shade? So I can understand, you know, on top of that, they introduced really great segments within the comic, like Bobby's first date with another guy. The only problem is is that these things had nothing to do with the actual action. They were just introduced, dropped into the comic, and there was no real reasons for them. They were just simply there to show that the character was gay. You know? On top of that, you have the whole thing happening in a theater. Yeah. You're doing a character who's gay and your story is in a theater and you've got a character called Shade in there and I'm like, are you bloody serious? It's just, you know, one of those dreaded, somebody just wasn't thinking this through. But, you know, you basically have them hitting us over the head with the fact that Iceman is gay, and I'm like, so what? You know, if you're going to do comics and you're going to bring up interesting political points, you need to actually have them have an organic reason for them being there. You can't just simply say, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have fun with this. And then I'm. But it's not actually going to be anywhere. That's a lot of the problem they have with that particular comic. You've got some really interesting stuff going on. If they'd actually organized it and actually actually planned it through instead of just simply saying, hey, we need this feature, you know, let's throw it in the comic and hope it works. No, you don't do it that way. You know? If you're going to have a romance with a former guy, it's not going to happen in a vacuum. It's actually going to have to have some sort of comic-related story. (laughs) You know, the guy's got to show up again. Or somebody similar to him has got to show up, and he's either going to have something major, a major part of the story on some level, and I don't care if it's showing up as a, another hero, another villain, or just as somebody who needs to be saved. 
yeah, I know, it's a little cliche, but it's a lot better than having a romance that's just there to show character sexual preference. You know? That should be literally dropped into the story. It's, there's nothing actually done with it. It's just there. And that's, you know, 37 different major issues. Um, that and you've got a th major thing is a theater. I mean, serious, how does that not border on homophobia? But it's just straight up. If you're going to have a political message, go for it. You know, comics have been political since day one. Superman did not just simply go after finding a super villain and kick his butt. He went after a wife beater. Captain America, first time he showed up, fist Hitler. Need I say more? I mean, I can argue Batman was probably political, but pretty much everybody else that was released around the time of the war was pretty much, you know, anti-Nazi or anti-Japanese, anti-both. With, of course, the Italians showing up for good measure. Specifically, all three members of the Axis. Um, but, you know, during the 40s, you saw a lot of political messages as far as the war went. You know, to be supportive of it, that sort of thing. There were some definite political messages as well as a couple moral messages. You know, at the very least, you had characters who were anti-crime. And pointing out that there were a lot of crimes that were bad things that happened. And we need to do something about this. And of course, you had a lot of those villains were bankers and people with greed. So, even though it might be a little shallow, you did nonetheless have some interesting political messages going on. Admittedly, a lot of these messages tend to disappear in the 50s, but that's because a lot of comics also disappeared in the 50s. But when the 60s started back up, you know, we started right back in with the political messages. It may have taken a couple of years to pop up, but, you know, you had Black Panther show up. You know, you can't really get more political at the time than a black character who's fully in the black rights. Um, Avengers. Okay, eventually you have to wait till almost the 80s before you see the infamous, um, you know, Henry Pym slapping his wife. But, you know, even... You did have the X-Men start messing around with civil rights, especially when Claire, Chris Claremont took over. Also in the 1970s, you had the great Green Arrow Green Lantern comics. You know, where you basically had Hal was ultra-liberal, Oliver, ultra-conservative, and the two of them made some interesting great points in terms of social reforms. In the 1980s, the lid was definitely, you know, the cat was definitely out of the bag by then. You actually had a couple of, actually, you started having some interesting characters. You did have a couple of gay and lesbian characters. If you doubt this, check out a comic called Camelot 3000, where you had a really weird, I'm not really sure if I want to call it transsexual or not, but you literally had the spirit of a man go into the body of a woman take over, and then try to reignite a love affair from millennia past. So I'm not really sure how that counts. I just think it does on some level. But you had a lot of weird stuff going on political-wise in the 1980s. In the 1990s, you saw a lot of it disappear. Taking a major back step, look over at the comic scene. And we're talking C-O-M-I-X here. Um, so-called because they weren't the mainstream. They had to be different somehow. Where you had, you know, some in really interesting stuff going on as far as freedom of expression. You know, the ability to use drugs you want. Don't believe me, look at Fabulous Freak Brothers. Or Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. Um, look at what R. Crumb did. 
you had a lot of interesting political messages in the comics. Even today, you're starting to see that come back to a certain degree, and when it's done well, it's well done well. Otherwise, you have a North Wind situation. You know, we're going to bat you over the head with whatever we're trying to say and hope it sticks to you. And like I said, I prefer more of a sun situation. You know, give me some characters that are actually having problems. That's why I like the, everybody loves the Chris Claremont run. You had civil rights. It was being presented in a way that made sense. And they were actually advancing the agenda as well as advancing the story of the X-Men. The lesson here is that if you're going to do politics in your comics... You know, I'm not saying be ultra subtle about them, obviously. X-Men, hello? But don't go into full. You know, the only way you can get people to do it is by blowing cold and hard at them. It just isn't going to work. The first diversity issue is sort of an interesting one. Now, I've already made a point in a lot of previous podcasts as well as a lot of my other writing that if we're going to have characters that are... If you're going to have characters that are different, you know, different skin tones, um, different gender preferences, so on and so forth, you need to have them as part of the actual story. You know, you need to grow these characters organically. You can't just simply have these characters show up and go, I am the gay character, and I am the black character, and, you know, everybody does not need to have a freaking label on them. Straight up, they should not have a label, you should tear those labels straight off, and just present them as they are. A lot of comics right now are having way too much fun when it comes to the diversity issue of having a forced diversity rather than an organic diversity. You know, they're basically trying to do... A situation where the characters are essentially a party of token characters and it just isn't working. Yeah, it's just, you know, don't get me wrong, I understand why it's just, you know, you had all these characters who are mostly male, white, and straight for so many decades. I mean, yeah, you had a lot of female characters, a lot of characters that essentially weren't white and now we have a lot of gay characters showing up. That's fine. But if you're going to introduce the characters, make sure that they are there for actual reasons, not just simply because you've decided, my story needs a gay character. No. You need to have those characters in there for a reason beyond well, their gayness or their blackness or their womanness or whatever. Those characters need to have a reason for existing that doesn't have anything to do with any particular political agenda, which is, I know, a weird statement. You know, after I basically point out, hey, go have fun with the politics. No, what I'm not saying is, you know, have fun with politics, but don't use any gay characters. What I'm saying is, if you're going to have a character in there, the character has to be in, feel like he's being there for an actual reason beyond you making a political point. If he's only there to make a political point, why? You know? Notice I'm not quite agreeing on... The only word in that sentence I'm agreeing with confiscators on is the forced concept. You know? Have all the non-white male characters you want. Heck, totally get rid of the white males completely. That's fine. But don't do it just because you're trying to make some political point. I think in a lot of ways that's where, the, and I know this is sacrilege and blasphemy, but I think that's where the Milestone comics sort of failed. Is that instead of introducing characters just for the sake of introducing characters, they were trying to introduce way too many minority characters. And I know how that sounds. But... I think Milestone needed to happen, and then some. We needed those characters. We needed Icon. We needed Rocket. We needed Hardware. We definitely needed Static. By the way, those people who call them Static Shock, you're morons. But, I have to... Yeah, sorry. Personal gripe of the day. I hate seeing people go, Hey, look, it's Virgil Hawkins, Static Shock. Seriously? 
you know, we start looking at the web comics, we start seeing some really cool stuff out there. You have, you know, stuff like Lumberjanes. You got some really cool stuff happening in the web comics as far as diversity goes. So definitely have the diversity, but don't do it because you need to have this character needs to be this particular shade of brown in order for me to make a political point. No. I know it's going to be sound weird, but you have to do it character first, story first, then your political point. Because straight up, if your comic does not work as a story and your characters are just simply cardboard, then nobody's going to care about your political point. If you want somebody to care about gay characters, you have to have a reason for us to care about the character part of that. He has to have some sort of really great story arc. He can't just simply be, what is your power? I'm gay. No. He's got to have something he's doing there in the story beyond just simply trying to flirt with guys. Or whatever. You know? And like I said, also I'll agree with the forced diversity is a bad thing. But no, we need the diversity. We need to have some fun characters. Everybody should have a hero that they can sympathize with. That they can understand. That they can actually relate to. And yeah, everybody can relate to, say, Spider-Man. But let's get real. We need Peter Parker just as much as we need Miles Morales. Miles Morales is an incredible character. And he works because he's not, you know, the Puerto Rican version of Spider-Man. He works because he is his own version of Spider-Man. He, There's some really cool stuff going on there with Miles that would apply even without these racial considerations. And that's what you need to look at. We care about Miles. So therefore, you know, there's a lot of stuff we love about Miles. And I'm not just talking about the great cartoon that was just released. Miles Morales has a great history all the way back to the Ultimate Universe. So, you know, if have all the diversity you want, but don't force it. Don't make it to the point where you're just having these characters just to have them. If the only reason you're having a character, you're not going to be able to get behind the character. You're not going to be able to get into the head of that character. You're going to have a flat character that is just simply his stats and that's it. He's only there to basically make your political point. And trust me, it's a really boring character. He will actually act counteract your point because, you know, if you as a writer don't care about your characters, it's going to show. And if your character is only there to prove a point, yeah, it's not going to work out in the long run. And, of course, there's the dreaded anti-legacy characters. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of great characters that are what... Just to clarify, because I know there's like somebody out there who's not following this, a legacy character is essentially a character that follows another character because they was roughly the same power set. And these can be used to some really great effect. Um, Green Lantern is probably the best example of a legacy character because you've had Hal Jordan, who then passed the ring over to Guy Gardner, who passed the ring over to Jon Stewart, Kyle Rayner, Simon Baz. You get the idea. You know, there's not just been one Green Lantern. Four, you had Odin's son. You had Eric Masterson. You had Jane Foster, Beta Ray Bill. You get the idea. These are characters that the basic concept works well enough that you can actually shift the basics of the character and have some, make a point and, you know, retire the old character, kill off the old character, or otherwise eliminate the other, the old character and bring in somebody new. Well, Occasionally it works, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it has absolutely nothing to do with the situation. Um, then, of course, there's a situation where they bring in a legacy character for forced diversity, and that's a problem. Riri Williams, great character. Now, 
when she was first introduced, eh, not so much. But they've had some fun. They've done some redesigns of the armor. They've had some change the character a little bit, tweak her so she's more of an actual character. You know, so on and so forth. Riri is, as Ironheart, is an incredible character now. When she first was introduced, not so much. So if you are going to introduce, you know, if you are going to basically do a legacy character, have some fun with it, change things up to make a point, but, you know, have it so it's an organic situation. The character needs to basically be part of the story and needs to evolve as a character. You just don't want a character to show up as a legacy character just because you've decided, oh wait, I don't have enough of this particular type of character. Uh, yeah, let's eliminate character X and replace it with character Y, who now has qualities I'm looking for. No. Trust me. If you're only substituting characters to make other people happy, it's going to fall right in there with characters you don't care about. Over time, you may learn to love the character, but as a writer, we can only afford the characters we love. You know, if you're not going to put any love onto a character, there's no reason to have that character in the first place. All right, just for the sake of belaboring a point, what we notice there are a couple of interesting themes. You know, if you're going to have, obviously, if you're going to have political comments, have some fun with it. Don't just simply go, this is what I believe, and just explore that particular narrow field. You want to explore a lot of different aspects of how that that political message works or doesn't work. Um, if you're going to introduce characters, introduce them so that they're actually part of the story. And then figure out some way you can actually enjoy the character. Don't just have a character there to make a particular point. Unless you're trying to make the point you don't like this type of character. Hey, in that case, go for it. You decided you don't like characters in Power Armor, so you decided to introduce a character in Power Armor just to kick them around a lot? Go for it. But don't just introduce a character in Power Armor because you go, you know, you notice, that, hey, we don't have a character in Power Armor. We need a character in Power Armor. So, hey, here's a character in Power Armor. You see how monotonous that is? Yeah. On the other hand, if you've got a really cool idea, or if you're basically going to thrash the character in Power Armor a lot, go for it. Or if you have some sort of message you're trying to get across in Power Armor tends to work well with that message. And you can figure out a way to make the character actually work. You know? Go for it. But the key there is, the character has to work. The character is not just there to for, you know, be a cardboard thing for your particular message. So... You know, one of those weird areas where I can actually get kind of what Comic C is saying, but at the same time, yeah, do not avoid putting a political message just because somebody's saying don't put a political message. You can even see political messages in you know all ages comics, and they can be work. They can work, you know. But moving on a little bit. The problem with what Common Kate's doing is that it's putting some shackles on creators that shouldn't have shackles in the first place. You know? And this can work both ways. But we'll deal with political correctness in another time. For now, what we're basically looking at is if you basically limit your characters to a particular set of beliefs, and in this case we're looking more towards the right-wing version, um... You're putting some shackles on creators that just simply shouldn't be there. Creators should have as few shackles when it comes to doing things as absolutely possible. They should be able to go anywhere they want, have as much fun as they want, and in essence, just create. I mean, there's nothing worse than seeing a creator who's got to deal with, oh, I've got, you know, that's why we got rid of the Commons Code Authority. It was just way too limiting and made absolutely no sense in modern perspectives. And now all of a sudden you've got somebody who's trying to reinstitute a their version of the Commons Code Authority? Seriously? No. It just isn't going to work. We've had way too much fun without the CCA, and now 
we don't need those little training wheels anymore. Because that's ultimately what the CCA was. Just really bad training wheels is all. You know, they wobbled way too much. And I hate training wheels that wobble. But, it was sort of fun to have them. And I think to a certain degree, it's sort of fun to look at and try to do CCA type stories every so often. But, the key here is, again, we don't need the shackles anymore, for the most part. So let's get rid of them, shall we? Um, Comic Key is also trying to enforce traditional values. Yeah, this is problematic because we're past a lot of those traditional values and we've moved on to ones that actually make some sense. You know, we recognize that marriage should be between two people who love each other, not necessarily male and female. You know, it's not necessarily pro procreation. There's a lot of legal issues that are involved in marriage. To limit marriage to just, you know, one guy, one woman. Yeah, that's not really working for us anymore. For that matter, we've got people who don't want to get married ever. But, you know, the traditional values... So we need some variation of them, don't get me wrong. You know, when we start looking at marriage, we definitely want something that's going to be people who are going to love, to cherish, to respect each other. You know, we don't want necessarily a lot of that obey stuff. And we recognize that marriage doesn't have to be for the, solely for the purpose of procreation. It can be two people who just really like being around each other and have established a relationship that needs to be, uh, shall we say, legally recognized. So, we definitely need to get rid of a lot of traditional values, even if we need to figure out ways to keep them around. They're not all the traditional values are necessarily bad, you know. All the Ten Commandments actually sort of work. You don't want to steal from other people. Um, you definitely don't want to adult, you know, commit adultery with someone else. You know, just having sex, just with having sex with someone else. Yeah, I can see casual relationships, but when we basically have two people that are in a, you know, loving situation, you don't want that one of those two people to go off and have sex with somebody else. Or more accurately, have an actual affair with someone else. They should be putting that affair on the person they actually love. You know what I mean? A lot of the Ten Commandments actually tend to work. We can actually make those work in our comics with no real problem if we just have a little bit of fun with it. We don't, however, need to be shackled to the pure black and white version of those particular commandments. And I'm probably going to a not nice place for saying that. Um... And definitely we need to have a lot more diversity in our comics. I'm definitely not coming down on that. I just don't think we should have a forced diversity. We need to have a diversity that works. Uh, so when Comics Gate is trying to enforce their traditional values, when they're trying to shackle creators, when they're trying to force, the, you know, complain about forced diversity, that's a problem. It, or sorry, not forced diversity when they're complaining about diversity in general. Um, yeah, that's a major problem. That's something we as creators need to strike back and strike hard against. So, what's the best way of dealing with Comments Gate? Well, first off, you see them on social media, treat them as trolls. Don't feed them. Ah, uh, there's no... You're going to want to get into an argument with them. They're going to want to force you into discussion and it's not going to work. You're going to have somebody trying to you to their point of view and it's just isn't going to work. They're going to go into north wind mode. Period. If you don't agree with them, they're going to result in name calling. They're going to result to 57 different types of persuasion that basically come down to they're right, you're wrong, get with my train now. Just like I said, treat them as trolls. You see them, ignore them, and if they're really being obnoxious, report them to the admin. Yeah, it's just straight up. Life's short. We don't have time to deal with idiots. 
and confiscators tend to prove very shortly that they tend to be major idiots. I mean, there's just no real way to deal with them in terms of logic. Straight up. If you have a group of people that honestly believes that they need to return to a place in comics where there were no politics, and like I said, first two major actions that happened with characters was you had one Superman going after a wife beater and Captain America punching a Nazi. You know? Right after that, you've got a definite dissonance issue. You know what I mean? So just ignore them. Um, if you happen to be in charge of a comics company, we definitely need to bring in some actual diversity. This is not just to tick people off. What I'm suggesting is that we need more workshops for minorities and women. You know, just basically, hey, here's how you do the comics. Let's have a little bit of fun with it and go at it from there. You know? We need to bring more fresh blood into the comics and it needs to be non-white male. Not a, more accurately, not a straight white male. You know, we need more flesh blood because the more options we have in terms of creators, the more interesting our stories are going to get. And if all we have is, well, one type of person, it's just not going to be a whole lot of fun. We need to not only invite people to the party, we need to make sure they feel comfortable here. So if you happen to see some somebody in comments get attacking somebody else, hey, go after them. At least show the person they're attacking that they have some support. We They need to get out of gatekeeper mode and we need to start getting into defender and guardian mode. No, I'm not saying that we need to necessarily act as gatekeepers ourselves. We need to support each other. And the only way we can do that is by showing each other better tips and tricks on how to do comics uh, by giving each other support when we're on this social media and basically have, trying to be friends. And yes, you can be friends and disagree. Yet it happens all the time. when You have people who absolutely hate each other's guts, but they do tend to stick up for each other. That's perfectly fine. That's a perfectly legit relationship. And it's those kind of relationships we need to foster in just a sec. We need to foster friendly relationships. If they happen to have a little bit of antagonism to them, so be it. We can't, can't get better if we're friends all the time and if we just go along and be nice. Which I know sounds weird, but, you know, consider a sibling rivalry situation. Siblings will def have basically a mutual, sh um, what do we call it? Have some sort of um, mutual aid pact, you know? I will be the first who will tease you, harass you, and make life miserable for you. If anybody else comes in and tries to take over my job, I will kick their butts. And we need to be that more that person with each other. You know, we need to be able to tease each other. We need to harass each other. We need to disagree with each other. But we need to have some sort of love and respect underneath it. And I don't think we can exist without it, in all honesty. That's something we need to foster. And to a degree, we also need to start getting rid of the legacy characters. Um, I'm not saying that every legacy character is a bad thing. What I'm saying is that we need to have a little bit of imagination when we do our characters and bringing in 47 different versions of Spider-Man doesn't always work. Yeah, it works occasionally. Don't get me wrong. But if you know, we're only bringing in characters that happen to fit a certain theme that we're comfortable with. We're not going to grow as creators. We need to get out of, you know, certain ruts. And if all we're doing is designing spider characters, yeah, eventually it's going to get annoying. And sure, it's an interesting exercise in creativity in and of itself. But when we start limiting ourselves to just spider characters, you know, it just isn't we're going to be putting ourselves into a major rut. And that's something we need to absolutely avoid. Um, by the same token, we need to simply have a lot of fresh characters that have nothing to do with previous characters. You know, don't get me wrong. We, you know, we definitely need some of those legacy characters in there. 
that can simply work well in terms of passing the banner on to somebody else. You know, those work those work a lot of the time. But we need to try to sort of avoid that situation as well. You know, we can't have everybody being a legacy character. Sometimes you want to throw in somebody who's totally weird and off the wall, who has nothing to do with superheroics whatsoever, and all of a sudden has to deal with the situation. That's a great character. As is a character who has no chain to other characters. You know? It's just, after a little while, having everybody be Captain America just isn't going to work. And yeah, I've seen a lot of different variations on Captain America, but, you know, I'm not saying we have to just have one Steve Rogers. Bucky Barnes works, Falcon works, um, even Johnny Walker worked as Captain America because it was interesting to see that particular take, take on the character. You know, if you're going to do an interesting take on the character, then hey, go with the legacy character all you want. But if the sole reason you're doing it is because you've decided that, well, I'm tired of doing this character, let me do something different, just retire the character completely, and if you want to, bring somebody really weird in. You know, have some definite fun with it. Don't limit yourself to just characters of this type. So... Bottom line, have some fun with the creation. So yeah. When it comes down to it, Comic Gate has decided to take Northwind approach. That is, you will do what I tell you to do, and if you don't, life will get really difficult for you. That doesn't work. You know? We don't need to have some no politics because that's no fun. People are people, we're going to have politics in whatever we do. So we need to have some sort of discussion of that in order to advance as a species. Um, you know, we definitely don't want to return to a simple era. It just isn't going to work. You know, ultimately, have a little bit of fun with it. Go to the sun route. Be friendly. Show that this is this is a really fun thing to be. Open up. Be warm. So, I hope that helps. And yeah. It's just... I'm sorry. I just can't believe somebody's going after a movie just because they don't like it having a female lead. That's just problematical for me on so many levels. And I'm not going to get over that anytime soon because... I like, you know, Carol Danvers. Fun character. She parties hard. She also works pretty hard, so she deserves it. But, bottom line here is, don't be that person who decides to go after another character just because you don't like something about that character in terms of general principle. Try to figure out why that character works or doesn't work, and just have fun with it. So, with that... Talk to you later. Have a good evening.